and setbacks. For Lord, they have a divine purpose that you may show us those hidden spots in our lives. So I pray that each one of us will recognize more and more that the trials, the temptation, they are under your divine hands. And all we need to do is look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And that's where we find refuge and help in time of need. Lord, grow us, prune us, produce in us those precious fruit of your divine spirit that other men and women might see those fruits and partake of them, and those same fruit be reproduced in their lives. So as we enter into your study this evening, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide and lead and give us minds to receive and the grace to walk therein. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray for his name. Say, Amen. 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 So, so we want to finish up as we left off. Now, anyone can give us a quick review. Just raise your hand and take the mic. Quick review. And so we need to get our, the template on the screen there, PowerPoint. Anyone want to give a quick review? So we can pick up this last point and be able to be refreshed. Anyone? All right. All right, then. Well, let me do this to prick your mind. Let's do this. All right. So, omnipotent power of God. So, we looked at John 15, 5. Anybody remember that? Well, verse 5. Verse 5. You, I can, without Christ, we can do nothing. So, we raised five questions. Number one, what is the meaning of omnipotent? Because someone can tell me the meaning of the word omnipotent. All powerful, all right? Number two, who is omnipotent? God is. Keep that in mind, huh? We saw that. And number three, how does this relate to us? Anybody? We saw that this morning. This, this powerful God, how does it relate to us? Now, we gave one text and went on and showed that, that he gave us power to become sons and daughters of God, right? Then we saw some other things. How does it relate to us? All right. Since you all were asleep this morning, I'm not going to spend time up here. All right. He is all powerful and we are in him when there is no substance. All right then. When the money can be made to merge. Absolutely. So how does it relate to us? Since he's, like you said, Cobb, since he's all powerful, if Christ is in me, humanity and humanity divinity and humanity and divinity come together and that becomes omnipotent. That means Christ in us, living his life through us, keeping us from falling back into all ways. That's what it means. Back in all ways. All right. How do we receive this divine power? Ask him. Ask him. And that requires surrender of the will. And finally, what will be the evidence in our lives? That's what we're going to see this evening. So how do we receive this divine power? I want to mention a quick point. We read where it said that we ask. We show you scripture. We ask for the presence of the Spirit. Then we saw that there needed to be a cooperation. We talked about the will. Anybody remember the will? How important is the will of the human will? How important is that? It's very important. Because this is where the very foundation for the victory lies, when we learn the true force of the will. Now, what is the, what the, how you define the will? What is the will? What is it? The will. The ability to choose. To choose. Decision. That's right. So we all have that ability to choose. Huh? Yeah, I want to be sure my folks are listening there. All right. So therefore... Now, can the devil force our will? No. Now, God can, but he does not do that. Now, why God cannot force our will in light of this controversy? Because if he did that, then he would be an unfair, unjust God. Unfair, unjust God. Then the charges against him would be all right. They, huh? 
is against his character. Now, someone asked a question, said, now, since, then listen to this question, since God knew that sin is going to rise up, but then they said, since God knew that Lucifer was going to rebel against him, did God know that? Yes, yes he did. He, he knew that. So then, why did he make him? What do you think, God? Why did he make Lucifer? Since he knew Lucifer was going to rebel against him. Choice. All right, it's a choice. Huh? All right, create to love. All right, you're all on the right target. But we, that's true. Yes. He had a choice. That's true. There's a choice there. Now, Rose, if you had the ability to produce someone and you knew that that child was going to go astray, just say go astray, and you had the ability to fix it, that he would not go astray. You don't have no choice in that matter. He's going to do exactly what you programmed him to do. Just follow the righteous pathway. Righteous pathway. Hmm? Now, so God knew that. So therefore, when, why would you produce a child like that, knowing, and you don't, you don't mess with his will, you give him free will, but you know that he's going to go astray. Why would you make a child? As a human being, I won't. <laughs> that's, that's, that, I said that. That's absolutely true. Being, As a human being, we would not do that. I see your hand. Uh, you got a dumb mic? All right, why she got it? Let her go. Yeah, give it Roger. So why did God create Lucifer, knowing that he's going to rebel? He did because of love, but he also offered Lucifer a plan of salvation that okay, he but, offered Adam and Eve. That's he true, but hold on. No, you're going too far. No, that's, you're right. No, I said why? That was before Adam and Eve, before anyone else. Right. Why did God create Lucifer knowing that Lucifer was going to rebel against him? That's the question. Okay. No, that, that's not that. You, do anybody understand my question? I'm not dealing with redemption. I'm not dealing, huh? Before he created it. Before he created anything. He knew that. He knew. Before he created worlds, everything, God is omniscient, omnipotent. He knew that Luke foreknew. All right. Is what? But, I was going to say because it reveals his true character. And what? part of that is love and not wanting to take away our choice. Mm -hmm. Understanding that as an example to the world that we have a choice. No matter how he creates us, we have a choice. He wants us to love him through free will, not because of force. That's very important, that love, love. Now, since God knew that this being was going to rebel against him and to force his will was definitely a denial of his love, godly love. Human love, like Rose said, if he, if he knew, she knew that, that child was going to go crazy, she wouldn't even think about even giving production to it. Even though you love. Love cannot be force. Do you understand that? And love has to be expressed in a matter which shows an unconditioned, unconditioned concern for the welfare of another person. Now, the lesson is, even though that being rebelled against God, did that change the love of God? No. Why do we get upset when we uh, approach in such a negative way? Mm. Why do we turn? I'm just saying, it's it just, uh, huh? That's solid. Yeah, because we talk about the omnipotent power of God. When you mention, which is true, when Christ is in me, no matter what you say to do to me, it doesn't mean it's all right, but my response would not be reactionary. Right. It would be one, as I say, redempted. And how did God? Now, God could not continue to let that be in, in heaven. Now, we don't know how long it went on in heaven, do we not? We don't know how long. It did not happen when he created Lucifer, then he rebelled. No. So what did he need provision to help you? That's true. 
but he, he kept reaching out to him. All right. So now, if God will allow the sinful person, I mean, that person just cognitive, just because God hates sin. All the way through, just like Judas. Reject God's love then they are subject for eternal fire. That means they don't burn forever, but they're going to be consumed. Would you say so? Exactly. Is that love? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Okay, I heard, I heard, no, wait. I, when I raise these questions, I'm raising it because we get to see this as we look at the omnipotent power because that's what God wants us to be like him. Did you get that? And he can't trust us. That's why we ain't like him. All right, now. <laughs> all right, now I say that he has to consume sin. You don't want to consume the individual, but they didn't let go of sin. That's right. Is that love? That's their choice, yes. Yeah, I know it's that choice, but I'm saying is they love. That is definitely uh, it's love. love. It's not they already made a choice. Yeah, it's definitely love because God understands He wants us to have joy and peace and happiness. And if we were continually sinful and to bring that into heaven, we would not be joyful and happy nor will we permit anybody else to be. And no, so, wait, wait. What you mean? The righteous would not be happy? The person that's there the that's person sinful would not that's be sinful happy. The sinful would not be happy. Did yes. you all hear what she's saying? If God allowed the sinner to continue on in eternity, how would they survive in the new heaven, the new earth? Knowing that there's no parties, no drugs, no, no pornography, no womanizing, no adultery. They what? They would not be happy. They'd be miserable. They, so that's, that's the, this justice is, is, is equal as his mercy. So even in punishing the wicked, it is still love. You got to get that. It's still love. Yes, sir. All right. I see that in um, Romans 12, 13. It says fulfillment of the law is love. Mm -hmm. and the second commandment says what you just said. Love. Love. So, that is that what you said. That's in the second commandment. So that is love. All right. So why we go through this whole spiritual gymnastic? Because what we're talking about, the omnipotent power of God, if we receive that power, our disposition, our heart's going to be just like God's heart. In every situation, we will know how to separate the behavior from the sinner, hate the behavior, love the sinner. We will not react to the provocation of the seemly slights of people to the degree that we react to that. And even in our reaction, expression, we let them know that we are highly disgusted and we're not pleased with them. That's not God. Go ahead. I, I believe you're kind of stretching that thing, you know? Okay. Pull it, let, don't, don't. It's getting tight, because if you let it go, it's gonna pop. Talk to me. Are you telling me that, <laughs> I don't think you understand what you're saying. Are you telling me that you could go, you're going through life and even though people upset you and so on, you should not even show it facially and there should be no butterflies at all going on inside. No butterflies. Anything down? I was, we was walking, I was sharing, I think we are talking to uh, Jackie. The only time that I read in the word of God where Jesus respond to assaults and insults. And he did it in such a way that they knew that he was serious. What time did you think Jesus respond to the insults? No. Not when they spit, not when they beat him, not when they tried to kill him. He only responded at time, on the end time. When? What did it say? You rebuke the Pharisees, the uh, Sadducees, and lawyers for their hardness of heart, and the judgment was to come, come upon them, and how they um, would cross land and sea to make one proselyte and twofold of a devil, and told them what was going to come upon them. The yeah, they, he gave rebuke. He gave yeah, rebuke. Were, but not from Pharisees, but in others, like Peter, when Peter said, you're not going to the cross. Yeah. Jesus told, told, turned around and he openly rebuked them. He James rebuked. and John, when their character, you know, command fire to come down from heaven, he openly rebuked them. Okay. Here's the point. Let me rephrase my question because apparently 
some, you didn't understand my question. I did not mention the word rebuke. You can give rebuke. I didn't say that. Because if you see me in error, you need to counsel me. You need, if you won't rebuke me the way God want to rebuke. I said, there's only one time that Jesus really showed even his expression. His, his so-called, huh? But, but, but what about, what? because it was in the temple, he found in the temple? When it what? When they were bringing the, um, yes, the, the what? offerings, and they were changing the monies, and then he turned over the table. Yeah, he was, he was eating up with the zeal of his father's house. When they began to really insult his father, began to ascribe to his father, which was not ascribed to him, ascribed it to demons and etc. When they began to attack the character of God, that's when you saw Christ's spirit. Even that was different. When you saw the expression and you felt the intensity of the insult when he began, when they began to attack the character of his God. Hmm? That's all the time you say it. All the time is rebuke. And they can spit on his face. They talk about him. They can talk about his mama. But when they talk about the daddy, <laughs> he rolls up. Are you with me? Any other time, you never saw that. And so, what we're saying as we go through this last point, that all these things have been brought out is nothing but a reinforcement of what we've been hearing from the last Sabbath itself. That God wants to really produce in us a heart like his to be applied in every facet of our lives. And that test comes when we are under duress, when we're under attack and insult. Because why? Because we have been prepared to come to the final crisis, which we know is the Sunday law. And we know that there definitely will be homes will be torn apart. The Bible says mothers against fathers, fathers against mothers, daughters-in-law, et cetera, et cetera. It don't have to be that in my home. Even though it's going to happen, but it don't have to be your house, my house, amen? It depends how we operate now in that home. How we operate now when the time comes, we have the luxury of meeting here. We have the luxury of turning on the water. We have the luxury of coming to the cafeteria, eat cooked food. We have the luxury of turning on central heat, central air. We have the luxury to do all that stuff. But when the light's off and we have to come together. And that's why, I don't want to scare you away, but that's why I tell folks, they don't know if they talk about trying to set up a self-supporting ministry because there's a greater responsibility. It's different from having just your family and two families. But when you have a ministry with 20-some people and they are committed to the Lord, you got to be thinking in terms that all 20 of these people, we're together, and that's why we got to keep message before us because we can become one another persecutor. We can turn one another in for a piece of bread. Are you with me? And so... We have to be thinking in terms of that. Whether that it might come down to 20, come down to 10. I got to be thinking in terms of that. Since I'm going to be here for a period of time until got to leave, then I got to think in terms of my brothers and sisters. We got to look at a way. We got to be looking at God's plan that we got to be positioning ourselves. And that has to be done as I come to a close of this. We have to be done with that mind that we are brother's keeper and therefore, we got to be sure we are connected with Christ. And so, let's get to the fifth one. What will be the evidence in our lives that we have received Christ? We saw Christ pray for the Holy Spirit. And that statement we read last time, it says, the omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit. We read it. Can we, re can we read this again together? It says what? The omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit is the defense of every contrite soul. Not one that in penitence and faith has claimed his protection will Christ permit to pass under the enemy's power. 
the, the Savior, Savior is by the side, side of his tempted, tempted and tried ones. ones. With, With him, him there, there can, can be, be no what? Such thing as, as failure, failure, loss, loss impossibility, or, or defeat. defeat. We, we can, can do, do all, all things, things through Christ who strengthens strengthen us. us. When, when temptation, temptation and trials come, do not, do not wait, wait to adjust all the difficulties, but look to Jesus, Jesus your help. Helper. And we dealt with the will. Please turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 39. It says, do not wait to adjust the difficulties. You go on to Genesis chapter 39. So this is about Joseph. This is a classical, practical example how the will is to be surrendered under temptation. You remember Joseph? His place <clears throat> as steward there at Potiphar's house. And Sister Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar, definitely tried him day in and day out. So we pick up here in Genesis chapter 39, verse 7. You see that? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 39, verse 7. It said, It came to pass after these things that his master wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Is that a temptation? Yes. Is that a trial? Yes. Now, we talked about the will, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so she tempted him. It goes on. <clears throat> but he what? Refused. And he said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master was not what is with me in the house. We have nothing. He has committed all that he has to my hand. Now, Joseph expresses a sense of integrity and trust here. <clears throat> and his master uh, giving him the, uh, the vote of confidence. Verse 9. Then he goes on and says, There is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee. Hmm? Because thou art his wife. Now listen to what Joseph said. How then can I do this great wickedness and do what? Sin against him. Hmm? So Joseph made a clear stand of his choice. I mean, he could have went on and submitted to that. We all tempted, tempted on different levels. But Joseph did not say, how can I do this great wickedness? against Potiphar. He didn't say that. He said against God. Therefore, he did not seek to adjust the circumstances. He did not say, well, Miss Potiphar, I'm sorry that I even gave you the impression that you might have this feeling about me. What y'all think about that? I'm just saying, well, just translate into your own human experience. Begin to discuss that. Well, look, you begin to discuss the matter and, and making some adjustments. Say, well, let's do this next time. I tell you what, keep your door closed. I will not walk past your door. Is that all right? Be sure it's locked. He did not try to make no adjustments. None of that. All he said, look, I've been trusted, but how can I do this great wickedness? against God. He made a deliberate choice. Now, that choice God honored. Would you say so? Mm -hmm. So why did he end up in jail then? Because sometimes you, you, even when you do the right thing, a bad thing might happen. A bad thing. Mm -hmm. mm. But it really wasn't a bad thing, but he didn't know it was. Make up your mind. Bad or good? No, I'm just about to. <laughs> it was a bad thing for him to go to jail. It's a bad I'm thing. Bad. It's a bad thing. He didn't Say it again now. What about the feeling of living, going through that, that punishment? Yeah. And, uh, and knowing that you're innocent. Right. And All right. Person is hearing that, thinking that you did this thing because you went to jail. That's the least of your crime. Okay. That's right. That, that's one of the jokes. But you're saying for the person to be thinking that. You, other people. Other people. Uh, or, or yeah, other people. Most definitely. Other people. What do you think about that? You think that affected Joseph in his decision making process? Now, notice what he said. How can I do this great wickedness against God? He was focused. He didn't, he, 
His concern was not what other people said. That, that, I'm glad we understand that now. That's what I'm talking about. When we make a decision to please God, it is not our concern about what other people think because God becomes my. We just read it. It says here is my defense. These are practical principles we got to get into our personal lives because Sunday is coming and Monday, now we got to co collide with human relationships. Sabbath, we had peace, we just talking good things. Now we got to get back into the field, fellow workers, family, and there are going to be tension and, and stress, and we're going to see we just had another good Sabbath talk. And we just, we're in the same circle. Mm -hmm. This time I've come to the Lord to get things. Well, I, we, I think we're clear on that, but I'm saying, are we getting what I'm saying here? That there's a preparation where I continue, even myself, the more and more I search these things out, and I said, Lord, you continue, just keep going deep into this heart of mine and throw up that stuff that's in it. Because Sunday is not going to catch me the same way. Then come Monday, it's sure not going to come the same way. Because I know, just my mind, every day there's going to be some testing. I know that. There's not been one day that would be no testing. But you said you know what about the testing? Hmm. You don't get a warning. <laughs> <laughs> now, now listen, what'd you say? Wait, wait, wait. Now, it, you don't get a warning. But God said, no temptation take you what? Unaware. Now, why? Because, cop, if we are in Christ, if Christ is abiding with us, but not even don't get a warning, if we abide in Christ, then God said he will raise up a standard against it. And so we don't need no warning because that is in us. He's going to raise it up against the assault of the enemy naturally. It's going to happen. I guarantee you. That's why I had to consecrate myself every month. I said, Lord, I go to my thing. I said, mm, you know, all right. You put it, I, I go up with my stuff. <laughs> I said, Lord, you place a watch over this mouth. Yes. You place a watch that it will not say anything that you have not put in it. If I'm rubbed, I don't want to rub nobody. You got to consecrate every day. This surrender is a moment by moment, day by day. When you walk on the campus, walk in the kitchen. You walk in the kitchen. I tell my little wife, I said, be girded up. Walk in the kitchen. You know, food could be two hours late. Walk in the Praise the Lord. How you doing? Super well. Cast that demon out of there. How you doing, cook over there? You all right? Good morning, brother. But we don't do that. That's your test. But then we blame the cooks. They should be on the job. I'm not saying that. But you get upset. Come on. I'm just talking about practical things in the ministry. These are practical things. You know, we all feel the pain, you know. You know, especially if I'm fasting, I'm, I'm ready for my first meal. To, that's lunch. And you know what I do before I go to the kitchen? I know. I said, Lord, you just come, close me with your righteousness. Let my influence. Amen. I walk in that kitchen. How you doing? I know it's late. I'm, then something I don't like, I put in pop myself. I pray, I say, Lord, help my taste buds. I'm telling you, I'm learning this. What do you think about that, Carl? I'm learning this. What do you say? <laughs> I, I heard it. Don't repeat it. All right, come on. Let, let me get to the fact. But Roger you had something to say. But do anybody understand what I'm saying? Amen. This God, Amen. you should never come to the Sabbath meeting. And heard this, because you're going to be proven this week. Amen. Hello? Amen. And then when you prove it, let's come together and let's talk about it. Say, where were you proving that? Could be it. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Those are real life testimonies. It's not when your tire got flat and therefore an angel picked the truck up and put it on there. <laughs> that's, that's all right to testify. But I'm talking about life changing testimonies. You don't overcome the, de the devil by saying, well, there was a tree, it didn't fall on my car. That, that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about what is happening in your heart. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. devil, how you overcame. Amen. That, that's what, that is what it said, that's how right. you overcame. That's right. 
This week, I overcame my anger. How did you do it? God allowed a wonderful test in my life. You see what I'm saying? I overcame that impatient spirit that God's trying to produce in me. That's testimonies. All right, so anyway, we got to move on. I'm just I'm, I'm talking about my fellow workers who are here now. Y'all just be ready. Newcomers, oldcomers, be ready. Welcome to the club. Amen. This is a, this is a good work. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. And I was just going to say that um, each moment that I have worship, the Lord provides exactly what I need to prepare me mm. for whatever trial is coming for that day. That's all right. And so I might know, not know what's going to happen, but he's already given me. And when and how it's going to happen. Exactly. But he's already given me the victory and prepared me for it through his word. And you are conscious, you are intentional and understand that. So you don't walk around here like you're impermeable, you, you're walking with a consciousness, you're in a warfare. Not that we are your enemy, but that the devil want to take the advantage of our weakness. That's very important. That's what I do. So Lord, you connect me. All right, you got another one for All right, Roger. Then we got to move on. Go ahead, Roger. Very quickly, I know that I'm going to have trials and tri tribulations every day because I ask God for them. I ask him. I All want right. them. And I ask him for a particular reason. I want to show to the world that the devil's a liar, that Christ through me, as his can say, can be an overcomer, and I want to vindicate God's law. And I ask for that every day for the Holy Spirit, and now my testimony is he does it every day. I never okay. lose. Well, that's, through Christ. That's, that's an my interesting testimony. way to look at it. That's all right. Now, this is what I see my trials coming, Roger. I see my trials come because God sees something in me that need to be brought keenly aware to my attention, that God want me to see those blind spots in my character. And through that process that he's doing and equipping me, then the world can see. See, trials, I'm talking about trials. Trials, I'm, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to everyone. Trials are necessary because there can be no testimony to anyone who is in affliction, who is in distress, who is miserable, and you cannot bear witness to those folks if you don't have an experience. That's what the purpose of trials are. You know, now, praise God, you may pray for the trials. I don't pray for the trials. I thank God for the trials. I pray for grace. I pray for grace in the pruning process. All right, what would be the evidence of our lives? Let's take, maybe we can do this in an expeditious way. It would be seen now. When we have this experience with this omnipotent power, which is the Holy Spirit, come into your life, my life. He brings all that which God is into your life. Do you agree with that? Amen. You come with life, life more abundantly. The Bible said Christ is the fullness of the God here. Christ is the Prince of Peace. Christ has much forgiveness. He brings everything that is necessary for a Christian to walk these sin cursed paths. Path. And with a life to dispel darkness. So it affects our personal life. What I mean by personal, your personal relationship with God, your devotional life, your prayer life, your study life. It producing you a mindset as you interact with other people. Now, here's the point. When you say your personal life, Christ, how did he deal with controversial issues? How did he deal with those who really did not show any respect and love for him? How did he deal with the slow at heart? How did he deal with the doubting? How did he deal with the impetuous? How did he deal with the thieving ones? Huh? So our personal life would testify in our behavior. And if that behavior is not in harm with God, that says one thing to me about myself. I'm not spending time with God. I'm not on my knees enough. I'm not in the word. And when I go into the word, I'm just reading the word, and I'm not really beholding Christ in every verse. Every verse. But then you go back. Christ says, you do not live by bread alone, but by every word. 
And so our personal life is the foundation how this affects us. And it will let you know whether my life has a living connection through the word. Yes, ma'am. Yes, well, we get to that. We get to that. that, that that'll come. You'll see in a moment. We'll see. That's a good point. But our personal life, see, if we do not have that genuine personal contact with God, then when I go on down the line, you'll see, Rose, what you said, work, you'll see it. Because if I'm a Christian, well, I, I'm going to hear because you mentioned that. But first of all, the personal life needs to be checked. Because the devil knows if he can get you and I to neglect our devotional study, neglect prayer, then he has us. Even doing a good thing. But at the same time, I knew, we knew a situation many years ago, a group of us, when we first moved out of the city into the country, little Goshen area, there was an individual there. Now, at that time, it was off the grid. So we had to cut down wood, stack wood. We didn't have no running water. We had well. So we had one well, about several families, we had to put water in buckets, you know, draw water who you would. We did that for years. No, no running water, no electricity. So these brothers, all of us, we was students of the word, this one particular brother. Now remember when we came in, there was no computers, no cell phone, no internet, no Google, no YouTube, no nothing. All we, when we traveled, we did not, we did not travel with our computer with Ellen White on that. We traveled with nine volumes in a suitcase. We carry our Bible commentaries. We carry our books. I, I, my old suitcase is packed up in one of those stores. We carry it. We carry charts. Another chart. I had a chart bag. Chart. We lay all our books on. So this particular brother, he had a family. I don't know how many children he had, but several children. Five children. No. That brother study. He studied from morning to night. What y'all think about that? Amen. Now he gotta get wood, he gotta get water for his family. Amen. And he used his quote. He said, Man, can't live by bread alone. But let every word. And if you want, just like I'm looking up something on the internet uh, on E.G. White, Brother, Brother Smith, you just give him two words. Pew! He tell you the chapter, the page, the paragraph, and where it ends. Photo memory studying. Years, but not walking the Lord today. That's to be balanced. That's a time to study, time to eat, time to sleep, time to work. And I remember again, and move on, one of our former students, and et cetera, and we was, I think was, we was in California, I think we was going up to where Sister Cali went, but this guy had to stop every hour to pray, Adventist guy, every hour. What y'all think about that? That's a nice devotional life, would you say so? So I just want to be sure when I say devotional life, that don't mean you stand all day. The Bible said get it up early in the morning for the sunrise, take it in the evening time. Devotional life, our connection, how we interact with people, how we relate to our fellow workers, how we relate to our family, how we relate to those that seem that they just don't understand, how we relate to those who have behavior that we don't approve of, but we don't know what's behind that behavior. We are not investigated that. Search out the cause. Then what about our marriage life? This will be seen in every aspect of marriage life. How is that marriage? Is it being manifested there? Because if we don't have a personal connection here, then we're not going to have that connection there. You see, it's going to trickle down, trickle down. It's going to be manifest all the way through. How does it affect our family? That means our children, your in-laws, your relatives, how you relate to them, outlaws, whatever you're going to, family. This got to be manifest here will manifest the omnipotent power of God, how you relate in every situation the way God wants you to relate. If you don't see that, then you know that your situation needs some checking up on how it filtered down to our church life. How we deal with our, our fellow brothers and sisters in the church. Hmm? How we address, how we deal with the error, how we deal with the so-called apostasy. How we deal with the church. The same way Christ dealt with. How we deal with the marriage, same way Christ did. 
how you deal with human beings, same way Christ did. We find now, now Sister Rose, our work. Here we have a ministry. This is what I'm finding out, Sister Rose, you know, you can do a lot of preventive measures. This is good, a lot of instruction. And I find in my 43 years, as you lay down instruction, et cetera, et cetera, already written, not the fact that it come up, but still those instructions are not adhered to. So what do you think about that? To me, God tells me, as an individual, if I have Christ in me, I'm going to definitely take ownership. Ownership means that if you're in a ministry, whatever it is, that that is God. Just like uh, Joseph said, not how you do this great wickedness against the ministration, is this going to please God. My work ethics, how I take care of the facilities, how I take care of the property, all of that comes in. The reason you can continue to, re to remind us of those things. And it seems like it does not come to pass. Definitely there are consequences, I don't say that, but that let me know the very temperature of the heart, of the heart. And so when this takes place, these things take place, everything will come in place. If they not come in place, now, you might be the only one that's doing what God told you to do, and it seems like the other folks not doing anything. So what should be your position? Huh? Be an encourager. Now, what's the difference being an encourager and a complainer? Mm -hmm. Big difference. It's a big difference. And so we have to, each one of us, the Bible said, we are our brother's keeper. And so therefore, if you see somebody whack, then go, I go to the brother and sister, we pray. And say, this is what, then I said, you, I said, this is us. This is what needs to be done. And this is what God wants us to do, that we can work harmoniously that this place, whatever it is, you have to ask God to download to you wisdom because you do not want to approach situation where it will be discouraging. And therefore, that's why people, and I say to any of us, those who have been in this work, that's why we go from ministry to ministry because we're looking for that perfect place. And I'm going to tell you, folks, you won't find it. But if God sent you somewhere, then he sent you to the right place. Know why? Because when you're running from place to place, all you're doing is running from yourself, and you can't run from yourself because you're sleeping with the enemy. So you might as well make up your mind and say, Lord, what is it that I need to learn in this experience? There's something about my disposition. Even though the other people are just causing all kinds of instigation, agitation, frustration, but God is revealing something about you. Because the fact is, is your character is fragile during this time. You can't run with the foot soldiers. You won't run with the horsemen. And so I'm not saying you overlook it. It got to be addressed. But I'm saying, even though if that situation immediately change, I've seen that happen, immediately change, we can happy. Aren't we happy? Sure. No more strife, no more confliction, no more agitation, no more discouragement. And it's all gone, right? And aren't we happy then? Yes, we have, because there's no more instigation, no more provocation. Remove that stuff. Remember, remove what we think is the causative factor, and then we have peace. What is that saying? What am I saying? Remove the circumstances, and then we are all right. It all remains the same. It remains the same. You can take the man out of the city, but you got to get the city out of the man. You can take the man out of the environment and change the environment, especially when you acknowledge that you want to be a child of God. Because we don't know what we say, Lord, give me a change. He's going to give you a change, but this time he's just going to turn the temperature up. You can't run from yourself. You can't do it. How are you going to run from yourself? You sleep with yourself every night. I have learned one thing, Lord, continue to work on my heart so I can work with my fellow men. Yes, ma'am. So how do we face ourselves? How, how you face yourself? Well, you look at Jesus. How did he deal with that? And you say, Lord, this is where I, I have a hard time of relating to certain people or certain situations. You got to make that known. You got to be specific when you go to God. You say, Lord, I have, I have this. And if you know it's not like God, I say, Lord, 
I choose to surrender this to you in exchange for what you have for me to do. You've got to do that. It cannot be intermittent. It cannot be one day. You cannot relax in this warfare. That's how you do it. I'm going to tell you, probably five years ago, I'm in the same position. The slightest thing will irritate, agitate, frustrate me. I tell you, I, I wouldn't go to sleep at 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm thinking about tomorrow. I'm thinking about all the stuff that went down, all that's coming at you. Wouldn't go to sleep till, nine, till 2 a.m. and I go to bed at 9 p.m. But these last five years, my dear, whoo, sleep is sweet. <laughs> I tell my wife, I said, why think about tomorrow? Tomorrow is sufficient of a state. I ain't concerned about tomorrow. I'm going to tell you, I'd be serious. In these last five or six years, I have not had anxiety. And things have not changed in ministry. <laughs> same conflict, same stuff. And I know what's been going on. You know, I take a Nehemiah walk and stroll in and out. I know things need to be changed. But you can change the outside. It's not going to work on the inside. And God going to prove, God going to prove us. He's going to prove us. You know why? Because I know God raised up this ministry. I know that. I'm clear on that. And he brought people here. And he's going to prove us. Because now time has shrunk. And so if someone got started another ministry, they need to start today. They cannot wait next year to start one. If you're not going to start, you might as well settle in, go ahead and get the scars the gray hairs, dig in, and let's go forward. Hello out there. That's what we're going to take. Get your personal life together. Let God download you. Get this life together. Your family, church life, your work, ethics, work. Let's finish. The waiting to witnessing. The disciples was told to wait, to tarry, right? On the day of Pentecost. Wait. It says, God, long has God waited for the spirit of service to take possession of the whole church so that everyone shall be working for him according to his ability. It says, then it talks about this, king, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all nations. Then the end shall come. It says, when members of the church of God do their appointed work in the needy fields at home, etc., so the spirit of service, you got to take a heart, okay? Serve one another. That's a terrible word, word. It says here, if the spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, what is the result? The believing soul comes into perfect submission to the will of God. Perfect submission. The majesty of heaven condescend to a holy, familiar intercourse with him who seeks God with the whole heart. And the child of God, through the abundant manifestation of his grace, is softened into a childlike dependence. You must commit your soul and body unto God with perfect trust. What perfect trust look like? Perfect trust. What does it look like? Like a child. What does it look like in your life? Just think about your life. What does that mean? Perfect trust. Perfect trust. Huh? Whatever comes, huh? Whatever comes, you say, Lord, you it my way. Mm -hmm. So it must be for me. So perfect trust. Okay, good. What did you say, Rose? So you give it all to him. You can do it. Well, when it comes to you, give it all to him. Now, that's perfect trust. That means you don't just give him that which you cannot handle. Him. You keep the rest for yourself. Yeah, you give it all because John 15, 5, so you can't do nothing. Perfect trust is that you have a total surrendering of your will into the hands of God. You don't make any move unless you get instruction and okay from God. You don't say anything to anybody when they provoke you until God tell you what to say and not to say. You, you ever sit there and been, been provoked by people and sat there and said, Lord, you tell me when to speak. You ever done, anybody ever done that literally? You have? Anybody else? I know I do you do it all the time? It says perfect trust. Perfect trust. Now you know. Perfect trust. You did it once, right? I did it a couple times, but not all the time. Why not? You know, sometimes it just don't happen. 
Why not? Because self rises up. Why self rise up? Because it ain't dead. Why is it not dead? <laughs> not connected. <laughs> you must commit your soul, body, and God. You must say, say, God, with perfect trust in his power and willingness to bless you, helpless and unworthy as you are. That's what it says. Do not become restlessly active, but zealous in faith with one object, namely to attract souls to Jesus Christ, the crucified redeemer. It is not the logical sermon, the sermon to convince the intellect that will do this work. The heart must be persuaded and melted into tenderness. The will must be submitted to God's will, the whole aspiration directed heaven. You must feed upon the word of the living God. It must be brought into the practical life. That's why we put those things. Your personal life, your marriage, your family, your work. It got to be brought in. It must take hold of and command the whole work. So God put us in these situations, not perfect situations, but to help us to develop this by his grace. If we did not have trials, I speak for myself, if I did not have trials and disappointment, then I would begin to trust myself. I would not trust God. So he got to continue to permit trials. Is that right? Amen, Walt. That's all right. I'm silly. You might as well get prepared. When you, when you, you're going to have them. But thank God for them because it lets you know you, depend, you need your dependence on God. So it says, with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection. Great power. They had great power to witness the resurrection. They didn't talk about it mechanically. There was something in them because they witnessed this. They had tasted it. So when they spoke, that was power that God gave them that touched the soul. It says, so mighty can God work when men give themselves up to the control. Did you get that? How does that look? We're almost coming down. How does that look? Control. What does it mean? Give. It says, give up to the control. All of us in here are control freaks. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. Amen. Nobody else want to. Nobody. You said amen. That amen for all folks in here. Hmm? What do you think about that? We, how does it look? Can anybody explain why I said that we all got control? We're all control freaks. We want things our way. That's right. We do want things our way. And if it's not going our way, what does what does it do to us? As it, Make you mad. Woo. Did you get that? Upset you. Control. Then it says we got. Now, so since we know this, then that let us know something, Wesley. I have not. What? So mighty can God work when men give himself up to control of his spirit. That means when I get mad, I'm not in control. The spirit don't have my, my heart. Woo. And. We're still using our gifts in the word of God. I said this morning, you can have the gifts, but not the spirit, not the fruit. That's what we have. What's that, God? Do you hear that? Most definitely. Man, you can be the mightiest preacher, the mightiest therapist, the mightiest cook, the mightiest business person. Man, you let that person, I know my wife's been Hours on the phone. That's why I pray for her. I know AT&T stir her up all the time. <laughs> she thinks it's going to be a 15-minute conversation. Two hours. Put on hold. I had to. That's when I, I should have put your feet, too. I should wave you. <laughs> I can see it. So why, why, why? God just letting us know. That heart is still... Need some molding and shaping. I look at my own, my little trials. If I ain't control, I got to be careful not to put my exaction on. I got to say, Lord, give me some word. That's why now I, I seek by God's grace. Say, Lord, let me not give any recommendation. Let it come from your word. You just, you just watch me. I say, hey, let, let's see what the word of God said. I'm scared of that. Mm-hmm. 
The promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or any race. Ooh, thank God for that. Christ declared that the divine influence of his spirit was to be with his fathers until the end. From the day of Pentecost to the present time, the Comforter has been sent to all who have yielded themselves fully to the Lord and servant. To all who have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, the Holy Spirit has come as a counselor, sanctified God and witness. Now, here's the key. To all who have accepted Christ. Now, if you accepted Christ, it says here, as, his, as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit has come as a counselor to you. Soon you accept Christ. The Holy Spirit is your counselor. Did you know that? You don't get your life to Christ and say, I'm not giving the Holy Spirit. Soon you accept Christ as your personal Savior. That comes with the package. I say praise God too. But we don't recognize that. Huh? With the consecrated worker for God, this is what it says. Whatever place he may be, the Holy Spirit abides. Keep that in mind. With the consecrated work. Earth. That means if you consecrate to the work of God in whatever place that he put you in, it says here, the Holy Spirit abides. It says the words spoken to the disciples are spoken also to us. The comforter is as our will as theirs. The spirit, notice this, the spirit furnishes the strength that sustains, stri that sustains striving, wrestling souls in every emergency amidst the hatred of the world and the realization of their own, not only this, and the realization of their own failure and mistake. Can somebody explain this real quick? It says, in every emergency, amiss. Hmm? Let's see what it says. It. And the realization of their own failure and mistake. Anybody been down that road? The realization, it says here, Right here? Yeah, go back up. All right. The spirit furnishes, all right, the strength. The strength that sustains. That sustains striving, wrestling souls in every emergency. You get that? Is that right? Every emergency amidst the hatred of the world. He's with us. And the realization of their own failures and mistakes. So what is that saying? The Spirit of God is with us, driving us to carry us through. If we stay there in our failures and mistakes, and that is something that we are focusing on, it will disconnect you with, from Christ. It will send you to a state of depression. Failure and mistake will take place. But we are not to focus on that because we have this sure word. It says here, again, the Spirit furnished the strength. That sustains striving, wrestling. So if you're striving and wrestling with failures and mistakes, then the Holy Spirit said, God said, my spirit will give you the strength. That's what it says. I believe that's what I'm reading, right? It says here, in sorrow and affliction, when the outlook seems dark and the future perplexing, we feel helpless and alone. These are times. Notice what now. These are times when, in answer to the prayer of what? Faith. The Holy Spirit brings comfort to the heart. So we should not, in our perplexing distress, first move to go to the sister, the brother, the preacher, the teacher. We got to turn our eyes on Jesus. Say, Lord, you promise. You got to hold God to his promise. He loved to be held to his promise. But you can't go in there with your own words. You say, Lord, you promised this. Even in the Bible and the spirit of promise, you said, Lord, I just read an inspiration that you said the spirit will sustain and, and provide me the strength during this time. I'm holding on to that. It goes on. It's not a, notice this, it's not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is, is not rapture. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is, huh? All right, let me finish this statement. Holy Quote. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting, notice this now, 
It is trusting God in trial, in darkness as well as in the light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence and resting in his love. Trust is having totally dependence upon God and confidence. And when we're going through trials, we got to understand this. It says here that it is doing the will of our Father, Heavenly Father. Right. Trust him. Yes, sir. So is there anyone, in, like a historical figure, that you can point to outside of the, the, the New Testament that reflects this slide? <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Case closed on that. Why you bring Why you bring that up, though? Because uh, get the mic. Yeah, I bring it up because I don't think we. I don't know that any of us have seen this. You understand what I'm saying? You know, I. 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 I for me, it's a concept. I understand it's 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 where we want to be where we ought to be. But uh, to say that I know somebody who has embodied this, mm -hmm. I don't know that I can say it. Mm -hmm. So I like what you said. Now, I hope that you're not stuck there. So, so what you're saying that this is what we ought to be. It's futuristic. But currently, nothing. I won't say nothing. nothing. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got a question. What hinders you? Me. So why you don't trust God? Uh, I won't say that uh, it's not so much not trusting God as not uh, wanting to allow him to take control. Well, okay then. So now, if we already said that we got new right. So don't say that you don't see that because you're looking through your lens. Because that might be people in here who are doing that. It might not be at that point where God want to, but I cannot say there's no people, no person, probably on this earth is not experiencing this. You can't say it. I cannot say they're not. I can say that there are some people are experiencing. Yeah, I would believe that. I just. I, I gotta believe that. I just. I just don't. You don't see it. Yes. You just said you don't see it. Correct. All right then. And the reason you don't see it because maybe there need to be some clearing up of the eyesight. So what is trust? Let me finish. What is trust in God? What does it look like? Um, it, you had a slide on it. In other words, when we can turn our will over to the Holy Spirit and, allow him, and, and, and allow him to take complete control complete. of our lives. That's, that's what he wants, complete control. Right. Now, do you see yourself on that pathway that you're now learning that, seeking to just relinquish more and more of your will into the hand of God to govern your affairs? Do you see any of that happening in your life? Yes. All right, then. So you're on the pathway. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Yes. Because we, there's an object there. We're looking for that, that. The perfect picture is Christ. Now, that's what we're going to become before he comes in the clouds of glory. But do you see yourself on the pathway of having this experience in various aspects of your life? And you said yes. Mm -hmm. and then I would say then, what hinder you from keeping on moving in that direction? Because you already made a step. And you said, you know, it's not so much a trust, it's just the fact that, that control, but you, you are relinquishing some control. Would you say so? Yes. All right, then, you're on the pathway, man. So God's just going to help you move on. So just be ready for the purging process, the pruning. Close your mouth. <laughs> did you hear me uh, did you understand what I'm saying and so you're looking around and you might not see see every one of us is on that pathway we are to a degree we are and we see such of a negative we can't see the goodness <laughs> because you know 
you, you, you know, if I we had time, we only got 15 more minutes. If I had time, I'd go around and say, why are you here, cops? Why, why Michael? I mean, why MK? Why, why, why are you in this ministry, period? Why? Why, you know, I know you took a move as God led you, and I remember your wife coming to school here and, and sitting on this brainwashing school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we don't see some of the steps we're making are trust steps. Because in, in 43 to the first 38 years, we made some trust steps. But I had not reached a certain level that God wanted me to reach. You get what I'm saying? We had to. We, I mean, leave, living, a, you know, you all, people had homes and then moving down to a 12 by 40 trailer with no running water and electricity. What you call that? I mean, maybe my family called it crazy. I call it faith walk. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So, yes, we're on that pathway, but you got to look at yourself. You said it, there's evidence that you have made some steps that that really, I mean, illustrate that. So we got to move on here. Listen to this thing. What y'all think about this? Tell me what y'all think about this. Preparation before application and consecration before confrontation. What do you think about those statements? Preparation before application. Let's not go to the second. What is meant by preparation before Application for you apply. All right, all right. We're getting ready for marriage treat, garden school, campus. Preparation. Oh, yeah. Preparation. Oh, before application. Yeah. If you want that job. Huh? If you want that job, you don't apply and sit down. You're not prepared. Amen. A resume gotta come up. Gotta have some. Gotta have some preparation. So when God asks us to do a work, He's gonna send us through a preparation process. There's no sense in making an application if you're not willing to go through the preparation. Now, what do you think about this? Consecration before confrontation. Talk to me real quick, please. Huh? Consecration before confrontation. Do we have confrontation, you know, interaction? Do we go into the confrontation without having some consecration? What does the con- what consecration mean? Set apart. So how did that take place? Well, you gotta, you got to go back to Christ. You know, if I have a confrontation, I need to have a conversation <laughs> with Christ. I need for him to really search this heart of mine because this got to be addressed, Father, and therefore you have to be one that consecrate me that before I go into this confrontation. Would you say so? That's what it means. Now, how many of us do that? Very, very small number. Very small number. But that's what God want to change in our lives. Want to change that. He want to endure us with power. Plug in the power. Say the day, disciples of the days of Pentecost were not only baptized with the Spirit, they were also were filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Now, while they were waiting on the day of Pentecost, what were they doing while they were waiting for the outpouring of the Spirit? What were they doing? Confessing their faults, one to another, confessing their sin. They was house cleaning. All right. So that means that in order for them to get that form of rain, they had to remove the op- obstruction. And that means all the bitterness, the resentment, the silent thoughts we have for one another, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff got to be getting, gotten out of the way while we are now living in this time. We have to. Even though we're going about the routine, but we're still going about it carrying out the gift with the wrong spirit. We must yield ourselves fully to the Lord, depending on step by step. Very important to understand that. It says surrendering our will to God. It says we must surrender our will to God so that our choices will be the right choice. You and I cannot make right choices unless we are surrendered to God. You guys say, Lord, here's my will. Here's my choice. That's what it means to surrender. Keep in mind, you got to surrender that will. The will means every decision you make that you have not conversed with God to see you approve it, you got to surrender that choice. you got to surrender that decision to God. 
if you cannot substantiate what you're doing, that God has told you to do that. Don't say, well, I prayed to God. If you only prayed to God for him to speak to you, you're still walking on one leg because you've got to have the word of God. Because in the word of God, you'll find the will of God. If God has spoken to you, his word would testify he did that. Very important to understand that. Our choice must be followed by directives of God so that our lives and those for, no, no, for those for whom we are accountable might be spared certain disasters. Did you get that? That means it says the decision, I say in this type of ministry, the decision I make probably in the ministry could either lead people down the pathway that they will experience disasters in their lives that could have been avoided if my choice was right. So every decision you make in this minute, every time you choose to do certain things in the work, then it's, it's looked upon. And people are forming opinions of each one of us, believe it or not. And they won't say anything about it. Did you hear what I just said? I'm saying whatever I'm doing here, there's only a few people come and pull your coattail. And if, if what we call not serious, they are observing all what you do. And they are building a conception and a perception of who you are. That's what's happening. We personally need to be very intentional about that because this is important. Our choice must be followed by directives of God so that our lives and those for whom we are accountable, we are here, might be spared certain disasters. With today's hectic schedule and the many directions our lives are being pulled, we must be willing to choose the Lord's path. You turn to 1 Kings 18, 21 and read that. Did you see that, Carl? What did it say? And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered, Not a word. Not a word. We only got two choices. Now, make it easy. If we do not choose to follow God's path, we automatically put our vote on the side of the enemy. So you don't have to say, I choose God. No, I choose the devil. No. Soon you reject God, you already chose Satan. So, is it this first thing that the people rejected God because they remained silent? <laughs> they couldn't answer that. They were under condemnation because what was that taking place? That was on what? Mount Carmel? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What was they doing before Mount Carmel? They were sinning. They're worshiping Baal. And, and so, so Elijah, under the inspiration of God, brought them to the face to face. And so that silent then let you know that was a reflection in their guilty hearts. Because if that was not, they would say, Amen, Elijah. We're going to follow God. Mm -hmm. They didn't speak a word. So Sarah is concerned. Not to me, hello. When God called for you, you don't be silent. You gotta be amen, Lord, and you cannot. And to be to be neutral is to be an enemy against God, enemy against God. No neutrality. Either you're on God's side by conscious decision, but when they were silent, they were guilty. That's number one. They was guilty, but they could have said, "We hear, Lord." So on the day of Acts, there was no schism in the body. So if there's schism in the ministry, then that lets us know either all of us, some of us, none of us are not connected with that power. Listen to this statement. Listen to this statement as we're coming out. One accord. Under the training of Christ, the disciples have been led to feel their need of the Spirit. Under the Spirit teaching, they received the final qualification and went forth to their life work. Life work. Now, all of us come from secular jobs. That was not your life. Nurses, uh, social workers, you name it. That's, that was your career. You remember, career is what you what? Paid for. Your calling is what you made for. So they went to their life work. What was they doing before that? They were fishermen. That was their profession. This is what it says. 
under the spirit teaching, they received the final qualification, went forth their life work. No longer were they ignorant and uncultured. Now, where did these men come from? Out of those 12, there was only one there that so-called had qualification. That was Judas. Mm -hmm. He was the only one. The rest of them was just poor fishermen. Huh? It says here, no longer were they, a, no, look, look, listen to this. Sheldon says, no longer were they a collection of independent units or discordant, conflicting elements. Yes, ma'am. What does it mean by they were no longer uncultured? That Can means you break these, that down? Yeah, it means when you say uncultured. Anybody know what that word to be cultured? You know, what, what does it mean to be cultured? Refined, poly, huh? Upbringing. These are rough, hardworking, raw, rough fishermen. Uncoop, just like sailor, cursed like a sailor, huh? Uncultured. They words was uncultured. You know, when Peter denied Christ and, 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 and when that woman recognized Peter, he started cursing. <laughs> he did. I didn't have all out of his mouth. That's what it means, uncultured, unrefined. Doesn't mean you got degrees, just unrefined, not polished. Hmm? It goes on and says here that no longer were they, well, no longer were they hopes set on what? Worldly greatness no longer looking for the big house the big car just looking at that which will help the furthest work take care of the very needs of the home and the house they were one accord that's where god is bringing his church that's where god going to bring the ministry one accord of one heart and one soul act 246 432 christ filled their thoughts the advancement of his kingdom was their aim in mind and character, they had become like their master. And men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's how God's going to work. He's going to take knowledge how we relate to one another. We don't have to be coming with a plan how they're going to get it. Just follow what he says here. Follow. Ask of the Lord rain in the time to let it rain. He will give you. That's Zechariah 10. Pray for the latter rain. That's what we do. But listen to what it says. It says, two rains, the former and the latter. Be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Job 2, 23. Talking about these two rains. The symbolic meaning of rain, rain represents the Holy Spirit. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. Isaiah 44 3. So that rain represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I will make them in the places round about my hill a blessing. I will cause the shower to come down in its season. There should be showers of blessing. Ezekiel 34 26. Rain represents the Holy Spirit. Now, Ministry of Healing, page 506, that's what it says. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. As the dew and the rain are given, first to cause the seed to germinate, to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the processes of spiritual growth. It goes on, it says here in Mark 4, 28. For the earth bring forth fruit of herself. First the blade, the ear, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. Did you hear that? Did y'all understand this statement? It says when that fruit is brought to maturity, God will then harvest it. Hmm. I don't see anybody here right now being harvested. We're in the process. Hello out there. Huh? That's what it says. The harvest is the end of the world. Matthew 13, 39. The tares and the wheat cob are to grow together into the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. 
So as long as Christ is standing between the living and the dead, the wheat and tares will grow up. And therefore, there will be a full maturation of those two. And God is now separating that. The end, this is what it says, the end of probationary time is that very short period of time called the what? Time of All right. The end of probation time is that very short period of time called the little time of trial. Now, we come to those last slides. Now, this, this is getting close. What do you think is meant by this? So we know where we are. The end of probationary time is that very short period of time called the little time of trouble. What takes place in the little time of trouble? Sunday law. Sunday law. Hmm? It says here, the end of probation time. When that law is passed, we know Christ is going to throw down the sin. Is that it's the little time of trouble when we cannot be able to buy or sell. Hmm? And during this time, the latter rain will be poured out and the loud cry will be given to reap earth harvest. So during that time, we find from this point, this day, up until the little time of trouble, we are sowing seeds if we are under God's control. The seeds are being sown. You saw me, we, we had a call, was that last night? Was that last night that call came in from uh, when I formed a student, went to school in 2013, and said they had a dream about me, dream. And now when I hear people having dreams, I tend to just kind of close my ears. And, I wonder what they ate. Yeah, yeah, what they ate before they had the dream. <clears throat> so I told them to call me back and pray. And it was very encouraging, very encouraging. And uh, during this time, we find, and the person said, you might not recognize <clears throat> the work that you all been doing has produced any seeds. But I know, don't be discouraged because God has definitely wrought some seed production. And so many times we might not see, that's good, might not see all the evidence of the work. That keeps us humble. But it's good to have words of encouragement. So, and it shall come to pass at the word that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see vision, also upon the servants and upon your handmaid. I will pour out my spirit. We must have the early rain experience before the latter rain will come. But there must be no neglect of the grace represented by the former rain. Only those, listen to this, only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we should not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain if we're not falling on. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up unless the early showers have done their work. The latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. Did you get that? That's the bell. Must be she set that clock for me to quit. That's all right. That's good because we're about there. The early rain begins on the, begin on the day of Pentecost with the church. The time of the early rain is what? Yeah. Is now. So tell me in conclusion. Now, what does that early rain represent? What is it? Mm -hmm. It's the Holy Spirit coming into our lives, bringing that in omnipotent power to bring a transformation in our whole attitude, heart, our personal life, our marriage, family, our work life, and we will know whether the Holy Spirit is governing our lives by what has been manifested in those areas of our lives. And that is something we can use for inventory of our lives. Is it safe to say that we can look at Galatians 5, 22 to 23 to see the Holy Spirit Yes, most definitely. That, that's, that's the mirror. We look at those fruit. Because that is the very consummation and perfect representation of the character of Christ. That's what he's looking for. You remember he says when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in our lives and will come. So that is the character trait. Those fruit 
the fruit. That's what he's looking for. That's right. That's what I look at. God said, now, Lord, you know, and you go back and read. That's why you should read 1 Corinthians 13 every morning as you read your study. Every morning. I was trying to read that every morning. Well, I'm just telling you what counsel said. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. Cause you to tremble and say, Lord. I'm, see, that indictment, let's just change it to enlightenment. Enlighten you to understand. He said, son, cops, I want you to be like this. That's not indictment. That's encouragement. Hmm? I know. Then you go down and you see uh, love is long-suffering. It's patient. You say, Lord, I ain't like that. That's right. You got to confess that thing. That's what it does. You call it indictment. That's in life. So, Lord, I, I really don't have this. But I see that it's what's required of me. That's right. But Lord, I cannot give you my heart, but I give you sent to take my heart. That's right. You know, some of the foolishness you want people to stick up with that. I don't know if this is in that picture. What's that? Foolishness that you have to deal with. All right. But see, this is what you're saying. The foolishness that the people display, right? That's not your problem. You know, I was talking to Tristan, and I said, you know, I said, someone called me, marriage situation. But it, they had a daughter was causing problems, and that was the focus. And I said, now, is your daughter a problem, or does she have a problem? You understand my question? So they said, she's the problem. I said, okay, you sure she's the problem? All right, now. If that problem is resolved, what you call your daughter, then how would you be happy at peace? Yeah, if that's it, I'd be happy. All right? Say something else occurred just like that. Would you go through the same experience? No peace, no happiness. You're removing what you call the problem out the way to solve it. But that's not your problem. She has a problem and you have a problem. Your problem is knowing, recognizing that you have an expectation of a person that cannot fulfill your expectation. And you're holding that person captive and hostage. And you're blaming your misery on her. And you misery by the fact that something is missing in your life. And you're not secured in your relation with God that you can be an instrument of helping the girl with a problem. Did you get what I just said? And so, when you... That's right. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I know some time passed. How many, how many garden stools you got coming this time? All right. You got 14. Now, listen. My wife is talking about... Now, wait, wait, wait. Listen. He had 14 garden stools. How many you had last time? One. One. All right. Now, how was that? It was great. All right. Why it was, was it good? It was what? I mean, I mean, uh, definitely what they learned. Now, listen to what I'm saying. What they learned was great, but was it challenging in various areas? So you don't have to get into detail. It was challenging. Now, you're going to multiply this by, by 14. You know, do, you know all, do you know all 14? Do you know all 14 disposition they are? And you're going to get out there, and definitely they're going to work, and you're going to give them a very wonderful object lesson, I'm telling you. You, you got what, how many days? What, 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 what's the day, the fourth? You got, four, you, got, you got 14 days to experience this. Now God, listen to what I'm saying. God is not going to entrust 14 souls into your hand, under your influence. They will learn how to hope. They're going to see you. I read that statement. We got 15 couples coming here. They all come. Next week on Thursday, 15 couples in a marriage retreat. Are you listening to me? Eight, 14 in the garden, 15 in the marriage retreat. We can stand there and talk good stuff to these folks. But if my home is shaky, I have no witness. 
and you're going to have 14 folks. Are you listening to me, man? And, and though they're going to learn twos, just like that one so that sold that one to the garden, that's what you and all of us in the ministry got to see. Yes, they need the twos, but the great success is counting the fact. Has one soul been won to Christ? Out of 14, out of 15 couples. If you cannot say that, if we cannot say that, after these missionary endeavors, all you have done is expended God's energy wastefully. 14 souls. <laughs> all right, any questions? And we want to pray. We want to pray for these missionary endeavors because this is serious business. Now, my final thing, I'm telling you, we just talk about in the Hepson. We are now in what you call a COVID situation. And those, I don't know if they still listen, but I know in 32 years, listen to this, in 32 years, as we ran health sessions, since we opened this new place since the COVID, We've had guests, full, t full house guests, and now we have a waiting list of 13 people who want to come to the health center. A waiting list. We have never, in my 30 years in this ministry, had a waiting list. Are you listening to me? We, we have people coming, or a waiting list? We're in a quandary. And, and they don't want to go nowhere else. That's why we got to raise up other places. They still coming. What do you think about that? With the crisis, man, with the crisis, a waiting list. That's why God, people can't put their head in the sand. We as an answer to people's problem. The garden ministry, the health center, the coal party ministry. We have to recognize what God is telling us here. He's shaping us. Let us not glory in the event. There's glory that God is in us because he's entrusting this feeble place with these folk. Hmm? And I, we was talking about that. I said, now, we got a waiting list. I, and then Carver with a heart open for these marriage couples, some dropping out, some calling. We're we trying to shuffle where to put these folk. No room at the end. So we have a lot to be thankful for. But the most important thing, I want to be sure my house is in order with God. This house, my house, this ministry. Because God ain't bringing people to these grounds under I care to be led down to, the, to perdition. You understand that? So gird up our loins. Praise God. Let us be encouraged to one another. Let us encourage one another. Let's pull one another side and pray. Let's see, how can we keep the place neat? How can we make sure this don't happen? We need to just be more conversant with one another, come together, which we will, because now God's going to be bringing new folks, so we got to get our house together, because when these new folks come in, they see us going the same way, they pick up the bad habits. We can't have that. We cannot have that. May God help us. May we be willing to receive his admonition and exhortation but most of all, his life of abiding. Any closing comment before we pray? Comments? All right. Let us pray for one another. Pray for the bright as they travel on. And as we lay down the night, our sleep will be sweet because all of our confessed known sins have been confessed of. Light it out. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the time we have to fellowship. I personally thank you that we can at least come together as few it may be to have this interaction. We don't have to be on Zoom watching one another, but we can have this interaction. We can begin to speak, to converse. We can begin to be challenged in what we know, what we believe, without being condemned. We thank you for your words of encouragement. We thank you for your promise of your Holy Spirit the omnipotent power of the living God. Oh, Father, come into our lives. And whatever is obstructing you, we give you permission to empty of us, to fill us with your spirit. Because what the apostle did in the days of old, even they spoke the word, 
They healed the sick. They raised the dead. They proclaimed the good news, Father, with power. Lord, what do they have that we do not have today? Except for the fact that they did surrender their lives into your hands. So if that's the only thing that's obstructing this, Father, since we can't do that, we give you permission to take our hearts because we cannot give them to you. They belong to you. And keep them pure for your name's sake. And shape and fashion and mold these hearts that they become like Jesus. That those who you bring under our influence, let our influence be a savior unto life and not unto death. Be with those that be attending the marriage retreat. Those who will be participating in the garden school. We pray for the students who have signed up for the canvassing program. These three missionary endeavors are established for one purpose. Souls will be saved. Grant us a refreshing rest tonight. Let your angel be upon these grounds. Let our sleep be sweet. And let your angels keep us safe. Take away our thoughts and put your thoughts into our minds and save us from our sins into thy kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord.